Okay, with that, uh, good morning. My name is Mary Leonard. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Pediatrics Grand Rounds this morning. A very distinguished speaker going to uh, speak to diversity and inclusion, Dr. Acosta, and we'll hear about him in a minute. Uh, as always, I want to call your attention to upcoming Pediatric Grand Rounds. Foremost, we need to thank the, Pedi the Grand Rounds Committee for really putting together a phenomenal uh, series of presentations on COVID-19, really hot off the press. So our next one is going to be Bonnie coming back to us for the third time, telling us about COVID-19 epidemiology to understand when and how to return to work and school. So I know that will be a, a standing room only. Uh, and then again, with the, the Grand Rounds Committee brought forward the importance of mental health and well-being during COVID. So that'll be our lecture on June 12th. I also want to make sure everyone's aware that all of these ground round lectures are posted on the Department of Pediatrics website and have discussed topics from uh, the impact on migrant and global settings, education, telehealth, perinatal care. So it's really a wonderful resource and we encourage people to go back and watch those presentations. Next slide. Ah, thank you. Uh, so our upcoming uh, annual awards for faculty and staff, it's right around the corner and you can see there's um, many, many topics. We have many deserving faculty and staff and the deadline for the submission is on the 12th. So uh, please, uh, please nominate your colleagues. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna pass the baton to Dr. Mendoza who will introduce our speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, this presentation is a combined effort from the lead, uh, lead program of pediatrics. Uh, if you don't know what lead is, it's an effort to make diversity uh, and inclusion part of our practice in pediatrics. And it's been uh, a program that actually went throughout the medical school now and has engaged many, many people. Uh, as part of that, they are working with our Center of Excellence for Diversity in Medical Education. Uh, this center has a, a focus on pipeline issues, leadership development, and looking at how we develop social justice for diverse populations. As part of that program, we have something called the Five for Visiting Professor. And today, Dr. David Acosta is our visiting professor. And I think it's very timely for us. Uh, we're all dealing with the issue of COVID, but part of that issue shows us how diverse populations may be more at risk. And clearly, as we look over the last 20, 30 years, there's been a significant effort to try to increase diversity in our workforce to address those issues of healthcare disparities. Uh, and therefore, it's my privilege today to introduce Dr. David Acosta, who has been one of the leaders in the country to make diversity, uh, inclusion, and equity happen at each of our uh, medical institutions. Dr. Acosta uh, uh, trained in family medicine at UCSF and then went to a career uh, at the University of Washington, where he developed uh, a Center for Cultural Competency, was Chief uh, Diversity Officer there, and because of his success, uh, was asked to come to UC Davis to be Vice Chancellor of Diversity and Inclusion, and also uh, uh, diversity Chief Diversity Officer for uh, the UC Davis uh, healthcare system. And again, because of his performance there, he was uh, brought to Washington to direct uh, diversity and inclusion as chief diversity officer for the AAMC. So Dr. Acosta is one of those people that not only has seen what happens in medical centers, but now has a vision about what's happening nationally. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Acosta. Thank you, Fernando, and welcome to, uh, welcome to this lecture. Uh, it certainly is an honor. <clears throat> to be able to have that chance and opportunity to address you today. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, also, what Fernando has not told you is that uh, he's a longtime colleague that we've both been in the fight for equity, diversity, and inclusion for many, many years uh, moving forward. And it's so great to see him still at the helm of creating our future leaders for that as well, too. Um, so welcome, and I also want to give a shout out to all of our healthcare providers uh, for the work that they're doing during this COVID pandemic. COVID-19 pandemic uh, during these unprecedented times for all the work that you have done in providing the care, taking the risk upon yourselves and your families to take care of our, our communities, but especially our vulnerable communities that have been impacted the most by the COVID-19 uh, virus itself. So what I'm hoping to do today with you <clears throat> over the short time that we have is um, I think it's we're at a time where we need to be really sensitized to 
uh, and I'm very aware and have a conscious uh, awareness of the institutional climate uh, and the institutional landscape around us. <clears throat> that's not only experienced by, by each of you, but at all levels of the organization. And my hope as I go through, as I go through this talk that you reflect upon your own lived experiences uh, that you have being part of the Stanford community as well, but also keep in mind about the lived experiences of the others, the folks that are around you in the workplace, uh, in the learner environment as well, and then compare in your own mind, how do those experiences compare? You know, it's those lived experiences that really reflect the institutional culture and climate you know, of, an, of an institution. And they really impact of how we view the learning um, and how we view the workplace environment how we treat each other, how you treat your patients, and how you make decisions. So achieving equity and inclusion excellence within our environment will directly impact how you deliver quality, comprehensive, culturally and linguistic competent care to your patients, because it starts with us. Second thing, I'm gonna, we're gonna explore two other concepts. Some of them uh, may be just a review for some of you, which I applaud if you already know about conscious inclusion. But we'll talk about what we've learned from uh, the literature outside of um, our healthcare industry about what conscious inclusion is, its ben demonstrated benefits, and also its intimate connection to diversity as well. And then a concept that uh, we've been talking about over uh, just the last year, this whole notion of the practice of equity-mindedness, and I'm actually using a new term today calling equity advancing, uh, its implications on how academic medical institutions can really achieve uh, uh, their advancement, equity advancement through inclusion, excellence, and diversity. And then finally, what I'd like to do is just end it with, you know, what is the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges? What are they, what are we doing to assist you all and all other academic and medical institutions in reaching excellence through diversity, inclusion, excellence, and equity? So I'm going to start with a couple of series of slides to get that reflection going. <clears throat> this past year, this past two years have been unprecedented, unprecedented times that I remember as a diversity dean when I was at the University of Washington and also at UC Davis that I never experienced and even my, in my role as a, as a clinician had never seen it. And I think the important piece when we start the reflection on our landscape is we have to remember and understand that our academic institutions are really a microcosm of society. We don't turn off what's happening around us in our communities, what's happening regionally, or what's happening across the country. We don't turn that off when we come to work. What we land up doing is trying to, again, deal with it, cope with it, and try to continue our work while these things continue to plague us. And so there's a number of challenges that our campuses, our hospitals, our society have been facing, um, and it's been quite overwhelming. And add, again, the COVID virus that has come in that has really impacted us. So I remember in the first parts of the months, we were dealing with things such as um, <clears throat> uh, anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, anti-LGBT, anti-immigration sentiments that were very flagrant. We were dealing with a lot of hate. Uh, we're dealing a lot of hate speech that was about us. The Me Too movement was also in great stride as well. But at the same time, <clears throat> not only did may it have impacted our staff, our faculty, our medical students, our residents and fellows directly, but sometimes indirectly as well as we heard, as we hear in the news and also hear stories from home and our families and communities of how these things were, were being impacted. Again, so we've had a lot of these particular challenges and especially COVID-19 has created so many new challenges that, we, that were totally unanticipated um, that we were not prepared for as, as we all know. Um, but what it also has done, it also, uh, unveiled <clears throat> the structural institutional racism that, that is prevailing in society, especially with the recent two events that have occurred that are pictured here about George Floyd and Central Park Karen as well. That racism is very much alive uh, in America today. And that we as professionals, <clears throat> again, even, even though we only deal with health care, the reality is that we do have a sense of obligation from a societal stance to really have find our voice in order to speak up and against this. The other things that I think has happened over the last two to three years is that um, we also know study after study is showing story and stories also from our learners and faculty and staff are revealing the structural inequities in our educational institutions that do impact our learners, faculty and staff. You know, our institutional policies, the structures, 
the expectations and just the unspoken rules have perpetuated what we started to see as a double standard for some special specific population groups, both the learning and the workplace environment as this graphic depicts. Um, and as a quote from Catherine Peltier Campbell, she's a senior academic editor at AACU, says that the legacy of our higher education is becoming even more difficult to ignore given the country's growing diversity and also the heartbreaking uh, scenes that have played out you know, across the years as well. <clears throat> A lot of the challenges that we've been talking about also have been are in our literature as well. And this is just a, a graphic presentation, a table of the challenges that are facing our medical students and residents from historically excluded and underrepresented groups in STEM. Probably a new acronym for you, but we thought that that'd be that a lot more inclusive. Um, but what I've highlighted are some of the things that have surfaced that the students are talking about to remind us about their learning experiences their lived experiences in the learning environment. Still the difficulties in acculturation for some, many of our students, just to the culture of medicine, it's unique language, it's a unique hierarchical and power structure. But also there's lots of talk about uh, being victims of mistreatment, chronic, my, chronic and daily microaggressions, racial biases, prejudice, frank discrimination that is happening even in our health campuses. And even with folks who are suffering from an imposter syndrome that they don't, they've been told many times that they don't belong there leading to isolation and marginalization in our learners um, that unfortunately has impacted them to the point of leading to uh, very critical uh, mental health disorders that we need to pay attention to and not ignore. And I think we have to really understand that we haven't really dealt successfully with the systemic infrastructure, the policies and the practice that have perpetuated these challenges that you're seeing on this particular slide. Um, and it makes it even difficult for students who uh, even faculty and staff to navigate and even survive in some of the environments that we do have as well. But on the other end, thinking about a being faculty myself, we also haven't done a really good job in creating faculty development for our faculty to know how to recognize these, how they manifest, but also how to find the assistance for um, these students and our learners that are basically may be suffering from, from, these, uh, from these entities that I'm showing you here. And again, I think we have an obligation to pay, to pay better attention you know, to the institution in that as well. I was intrigued by this blog. It was written by uh, Julie Shane. She's a, a U of W faculty <clears throat> and a coordinator of gender, women, and sexual studies. But I was intrigued by the notion of the emotional labor that I think a lot of it will resonate with many of you in the audience. And it's the, she defines it as emotional labor is about supporting students as they experience alienation, marginalization, and trauma, which prevent them from working to their full potential. And I would also add in the work that I've done, and I know the work that you do, it's not just the students that we also support from these, but it's also some of the staff who know that we have open door policies. Some of our early career faculty members who seek us out as faculty members because they know that we have open door policies that we're willing to drop anything, whether it's a grant or writing a manuscript uh, to listen. Because we've also learned that <clears throat> essentially they are our canaries in the cage. And what I mean by that is that um, the, for those of you who may not know the, the, what canary in a mine means is that in the old days before we had any uh, advanced technology, uh, canaries were carried in a cage into the deep coal mines there. And they were very sensitized to a lot of the toxins and the gases that were expelled once they were mining for, the, for this. And the miners would take these in to check out the gases before they went into these tunnels and if essentially the canary collapsed due to the environment itself then they had only about 10 minutes to escape that case so they wouldn't suffer the same thing. And so they're one of our canaries in the cage making that metaphor because through the emotional labor that a lot of our faculty do, through their listening, they hear how our institutions are failing to meet the needs of our minoritized and traumatized students, uh, faculty and staff. And at the same time, they struggle between balancing this obligatory work and the other scholarly activity that they're expected to accomplish that can be quite taxing. We even have data <clears throat> that is there showing about the mistreatment piece. This comes from the AAMC 2019 graduate questionnaires that all of our fourth year medical students fill out. And this is just the national all medical schools report. Every medical school gets a report specific to their own institution. But the thing I'll highlight here is that on question, on one of the questions number 42, it asked them, have you personally experienced or witnessed mistreatment or harassment in the four years that you've been you know, at your medical institution? 
And if you look at the members over the last six years from 2014, the needle hasn't budged much. That in 2019, 40% of our uh, graduating fourth year medical students, and that's over 15,000 of them, said that, yes, I personally experienced mistreatment, harassment, abusive behavior, um, you know, at the time during my medical, uh, my medical experience. Where we've done really well, of course, we basically have put a lot of our efforts in the past 10 years of making our students more aware of the policies that we have regarding mistreatment uh, and abrasive behavior and the, and the no tolerance to it. They're also, we spend time on onboarding them about our procedures for reporting the mistreatment as well. But even despite our best efforts, we find that when we ask the question uh, number 45, question number 45, so if you basically um, experience this, did you report any of that behavior, you know, according to policy and according to the procedure? And still only about 23% of the students said yes to that. The majority said no. And when we asked them, why didn't you report any incidents of these behaviors? And 39% said, I do not think that anything would be done about it. And then and about 30% of them said, because I was fear, fearful of retribution and reprisal from it if I did that. And I pause just for a second because what this is really about, this is really about our institutional culture and climate that our students that are with us for a short period of time pick up and witness and prevent them from doing the right thing for themselves and providing uh, and getting the help that they need. For residents are really no different. There's so many studies that have come out over the last five years uh, looking at this since we've been looking at mistreatment. And this is just an older study from Finesse and colleagues who looked at 59 studies um, looking at the prevalence of harassment and discrimination uh, among medical students and residents. And again, the most thing I'll just point out is that residents too, 63.4% in 19 studies and over 11,000 residents basically said, yeah, I, I've been a victim of harassment as well. And you can see on the table, um, and these slides will be available to you as well, that when you disaggregate this down, what type of harassment, gender discrimination is at the top at about 66% as well. But our faculty also, uh, again, face the same challenges um, as well. And that's what this particular slide depicts for you. And so the ones in italics are ones that, again, we saw in the prior slide that are still come to bear for our faculty as they are in our institutions as well. But there's also some other ones that also pop up that are a lot more frequent that we find when you look at the literature, basically looking at uh, what are our minority faculty and our women facing when they reach there. And a couple of these, you'll probably already know, some of you in the audience already know these, but just to mention for those who don't, code switching is all about um, people of color uh, and women besides people of color having to switch their identities in order to conform with the major dominant group. And this is a very vulnerable space that places our uh, faculty in, um, because if they don't, if they don't coach, if they don't switch their identity, um, they feel that they don't fit in, they feel very vulnerable, and as a result, they can never be really truly authentic when they're called to the table for decisions as well. Um, you certainly know about the minority tax that I'm not going to go over. But the race, other one that I thought found really interesting was the work done by uh, Dr. William Smith out of the University of Utah on racial battle fatigue. He studied battle fatigue in veterans uh, in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq over the years. And he was really struck by when he started teaching, it was back in, at the University of Utah, and interviewing many of the faculty that were there that the manifestations that they had were very similar to what he uh, was experiencing when he was doing this work with veterans. And that is that the faculty were perceiving their environment as being extremely stressful, exhausting, and very diminishing to their sense of control, their sense of meaning, and their sense of comfort to the point that they had manifestations of feelings of loss, ambiguity, helplessness, and hopelessness much like our veterans when they returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. But also we can't, we can't ignore the work that has been done uh, by the uh, NASA Action Collaborative Group on sexual and gender harassment from the report that was released last summer that basically cited that in academia, we're number two on the list of having the most female faculty and female students that uh, basically have cited um, that they have been victims of sexual harassment. And as the slide depicts, more than 50% of our female faculty and staff in academia, and between 20 to 50% of female students in STEM, you know, have experienced sexual harassment in our institution. So why is this so important? Why are we bring? Why am I bringing this up and starting to talk to set the framework for what I want to talk about? Because now we have uh, good studies and documentation with our medical students and residents that have been published as a result of the impact that mistreatment has in our 
our learners. And that is there's been strong evidence has shown that there, there's an increase in poor emotional and mental health outcomes. That includes substance abuse and chemical abuse. I think decrease uh, self-confidence and self-esteem, which leads to it impacts per academic performance, including critical and analytical thinking, which in turn affects uh, our patient, their patient care. And then findings of increased depression, suicide ideation, and the latest study by Derby on increase in suicidality as well. Post-traumatic stress disorder because of this mistreatment is also prevalent, as well as burnout. So burnout not just happening in the physicians from the Mason report that I'll show, but also in our students as well. Um, just as a reminder from the National Academy in 2017, when they were doing the work on wellness and resilience, found a staggering statistic that more than 50% of our US physicians reported significant symptoms of burnout. And that tended to be twice as much as any other US worker uh, in other fields, even when you controlled for work hours and other factors. And, other, and the thing that was very devastating is the fact that uh, over 400 physicians die every year by suicide, a rate that is more than twice the general population. And the phys physician rates of depression remain alarmingly high at about 39%. So given these findings, you know, we as faculty and as administrators, you know, have to believe that we have an obligation to pay better attention to our institutional culture and climate and make those system changes that will help mitigate these. Shana felt, and those were really also found in their studies in, in Mayo proceedings of that the impact of physician burnout led to broken relationships, substance abuse, depression, and suicide down, like we just saw in, in, the, in the residents and the, and the students, but also it, as it impacts the professional uh, professional life. They also discovered that um, impending burnout and burnout itself decreased the quality of care that was delivered, the increase in patient errors, decrease in patient satisfaction, decreased productivity uh, and professional effort, and a high physician turnover rate because of it. And faculty are no different. A recent study that came out from our colleagues here at the AAMC looked at <clears throat> how did that compare to burnout across U.S. medical school faculty. And just to go through the uh, slide just a little bit, on what the color is um, depict if you can't see it, is that the green bars represent that they enjoy their work. The yellow bars represent that they're under stress. The mahogany bar is burning out and the very dark red brownish bar is they are burned out. And so the percentage of physicians that reported, the percentage of faculty that reported the burnout is really similar um, to what we found with the NASM report as well. Overall, they, the study looked at 13 institutions and over 7,650 faculty responded for a 74% overall response rate from January 2016 to September 2018. And overall, 29% of all faculty are either showing symptoms of burning out or they're burned out. And 31% of those who provided patient care in clinical departments reported one or more symptoms of burnout versus those of 28% who didn't provide patient care. And I'm sure if we fast forward and did the study today, we'd see probably a higher prevalence of those providing patient care given the COVID pandemic that we have to pay attention to. But even our basic science uh, department uh, faculty as well, 26% of them also reported symptoms of burnout. Um, and as you can see on the, on the graphic as well, there's still a large percent, greater than 40% of our faculty we report feeling under stress, even if they did not report experiencing burnout symptoms. When we look at race and gender, we find that women faculty reported higher levels of burnout than men. 35% uh, of our URM women faculty reported burnout versus 21% of the URM men faculty. And 35% of non-URM women faculty also reported burnout versus 26% of the non-URM men faculty as well. When, we look, when they looked at the faculty responses to engagement uh, across the board and how it's related to self-reported uh, burnout, um, the frightening thing was that as the self-reported levels of burnout increased among faculty, we found that the satisfaction with their department and with their school also decreased, and the intent to leave also increased the more people that were having uh, increased burnout, who were burned out or those that were also burning out as well. So the implications of this in my mind are pretty clear as I go around the country and visiting different institutions and hearing stories and the narratives from our faculty, our students and residents is that you know, as the Mason's report, both in the Sexual Gender Harassment and Wellness and, uh, and Resilience report has said, you know, the top implicator, when you look do a root analysis of what's causing a lot of the burnout and resilience and the mistreatment, it's all related to institutional culture and climate. So the AAMC and the work I've been doing in the last three years, uh, the AAMC is really pushing us forward 
um, to really begin focusing, doing a deeper dive and looking at the learning and workplace environment. And the notion is that how can we basically transform it uh, to the point of what else is missing that we may want to begin looking at in order to get us there um, as well. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about how equity advancing learning workplace environments are going to be a key to maybe thinking about it. It's a new dimension that we don't, some are talking about it, but not very many. And so just for definition purposes, this is just one way of looking at it. But as I work, go through the rest of this uh, talk, I'll spell out what does it mean to be equity minded. But I believe strongly, and I'll just say this from the get-go, that I think the third dimension uh, to achieve excellence in our institution related to diversity is really is equity itself. And so just by definition, an equity-minded or an equity-advancing learning and workplace environment is one where everybody, everybody in that organization, whether you're staff, faculty member, or whether you are a uh, learner, um, is that everybody is given the opportunity to attain their full potential. And no one, and I'll repeat that, no one is disadvantaged from achieving that potential because of their social position, <clears throat> meaning the power differential, the hierarchy, or their group identity or other socially determined circumstance. And so when I talk about the opportunities, what we're talking about are things that we can all relate to and all things that we all want as human beings. And those are depicted on the slide on the left-hand side. And it, uh, the slide is not, the graphic is not meant to be limited to just these, but to give you an idea what opportunities we're looking at. Because again, when you look at it, we're all going to be able to relate to a lot of this. And that is, we don't want personal development. <clears throat> we all want professional development. We all want those educational opportunities, including job opportunities as well, in order to move ourselves forward and advance ourselves. We want access to those opportunities. We want to have uh, some equity, salary equity across the board for what we do. Um, I've included health in there as well as housing, but I think we talk a lot about health equity, but I, my talk really is talking at equity at a larger scale and not just limited to health equity itself. Health equity is important to misunderstanding. But again, this, what this is really about, this is really about an, uh, our institution uh, being intentional about investing in everybody that works within the institutional community. And that also includes uh, staff. We frequently a lot of talk in academia about our, our learners and our faculty, but it's our staff that support us and allow us to do the work we do, do the scholarly work we do, so the patient we see, and without them, we probably couldn't survive. And so where a lot of this came from, I think, is that's a lot of the work that came from the Association of American Colleges and Universities. In 2015, um, they launched an educational equity initiative for the students that they serve. And I was really intrigued with it because as I began looking into this, it just seemed that our medical schools, all of our health profession schools, could really begin thinking about changing our mindsets of how we look at our learners um, in higher education as well. Um, and so if you haven't read it, I'd highly recommend uh, taking a look at this uh, called Step Up and Lead for Health Equity, uh, what higher education can, uh, can do to reverse our deepening divides. And essentially, um, Tia McNair, who, uh, who writes about this uh, and is working with a group that has really moved the initiative forward, um, thinking about it through an equity lens, it really reframes our conversations that we have about student success. But I would even add faculty and staff success to that, as I will, as I think, for our definition for medical school, for academic medicine. But it really reframes that conversation about student success from this mindset that we have about focusing on students' deficits and their limitations um, to approaches that to change the whole paradigm, to really begin focusing on the student assets. What do they bring to the table? Instead of concentrating on their deficits, look at, look at the assets that they bring. Let's leverage the, the build from that. And then we as an institution must be, uh, again, responsible and held accountable for our effectiveness in allowing and, and having these students be successful you know, in our higher education scheme. And so what does it mean? So to, just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea and, and peel this down a little bit, you know, what it means and how they describe it is that, you know, we look at, you know, we are evidence-based. And so it's that willingness to look at student outcomes and disparities at all educational levels. And we disaggregate it by the race and ethnicity as well as socioeconomic status and other disadvantaged variables as well. It's that recognition that individual students are not responsible for the unequal incomes, uh, outcomes of the groups that they have historically experienced discrimination and marginalization in the United States. It's a systems problem. 
and it's not equal. And that's what this tries to depict for you on the slide, on the graphic next to it, is that we all want our students to achieve uh, excellence and achieve diploma, but the starting line is different for everybody. And this is not to degrade those who basically have come from higher income families and have a lot more higher opportunities for that. But again, I think it's important for us as educators to realize that we all do start on different planes um, where we have some students that are have educated parents that have graduated from higher education. Um, they have access to many opportunities to help them move forward. We have a second subset of students that may only have a, only a portion of those opportunities but we have another uh, large percentage of students that actually um, have start from even below ground in order to try to achieve and have a higher hill to climb. So this is the whole notion about equity. Equity mindedness means it's the belief that fairness of allocating additional college and community resources to students who have greater needs due to the systemic shortcomings of our educational system um, in providing them. It's looking beyond the stereotype and assumptions by society that society makes on these individuals and respect the aspirations of all students and the struggles that all of them go through, especially those that haven't really well served by our current educational system. And then lastly, it's also recognizing um, in the entrenched biases, stereotypes, and discrimination that have been embedded in our institutions of higher education for many, many years, um, but also requiring us to deconstruct those uh, to, to find a better and a more uh, equitable life for our students. So the big question is, can we, do I think we can adopt this mindset? You know, and I'm here to say today, basically, is I, I think we can. I think this is a wonderful moment to be able to do this, given the inequities that have been highlighted, not only in just this past year from the uh, preliminary uh, pictures that and photos I told you of our times, but also because what COVID-19 has uncovered for us and in the, in the vast inequities that our vulnerable communities do face, many of the, which our students, our learners, our faculty and staff come from that we've been paying attention to. So I think if we can move forward and become and adopt what the AACU has done, is how can we move forward to become these equity-minded leaders and equity-minded medical educators? Because the equity-minded um, uh, leaders and medical educators recognize that persistent inequities that exist are a result of the social and structural inequities in our educational system. And the understanding that we as medical leaders and medical educators, we have an obligation to begin addressing those inequities and the fallout that they create in our students, our faculty, and our staff. So essentially, these leaders are change agents, and they use this mindset in order to act for systemic change as well. And they're evidence-based, they're race conscious, they're institutionally focused, they're systemically aware, and they're also equity advancing. So let me just kind of spell that out of what that means and, and a little bit more. So why this is that, Evidence-based means that we need to be more evidence-based. And part of being, we, are, we already know what that means in, in medicine. But now if we expand it, we need, to, we need to proactively educate ourselves about the social and the historical context of the structural oppression, the experimentation in medicine, and the exclusionary practices in our historical academic medicine. And we have to understand the impact of that history on how it plays out today and how it has formulated many of our policies and procedures. And this is not a blaming thing at all. This is just really about, I think, our forefathers basically created a lot of these policies and procedures to benefit a few, but not all. And again, I think this is a time where we are able to learn from our past wrongs, not to repeat history, but to basically begin um, changing the systems that, that are in front of us but we have to have that historical context. I'm always surprised about how ahistoric we are and don't realize about the racist past that academic medicine has had, including AAMC. The second piece of this is that we need to be equity advancing, meaning that we need to reject this ingrained habit of blaming our inequities or the outcomes in our learners and their social and cultural and educational backgrounds. You know, we need to more focus on what do they bring to the table? What are those assets? And, once we find those assets, how do we focus on those and how do we leverage those assets uh, for the students and quit uh, looking at their limitations uh, and blaming them if they fail, as, as an example, in our, in our higher education classes. The third component is really the elimination of really focusing on and being race conscious and really looking intentionally at the entrenched biases, both conscious and unconscious, uh, the prevailing stereotypes, not only just in society, but within our institutions in any form of discrimination that, that, that we come across. Um, it's gonna require a very close look at our culture, 
but also at our structures, our policies, our practices, but also the traditional values and the culture that have been uh, embedded in our institutions that have been presumed to be race neutral that sustain these particular uh, inequities as well. Systems Aware basically looks at we need to become leaders that are very systems-based thinking because <clears throat> that to promote us and we need that to promote systems-based thinking to make necessary transformative changes in medical education and healthcare delivery. And we need to shift the paradigm from where it is. We have a paradigm where we weed out, we screen out, we sink or swim, we publish or perish. And we've got to change that mindset and move to one of what, how do we invest in the people that we bring in who are going to be our future physicians, our future leaders as well. We also need to be institutionally focused. And that just means we need to shine a, fl a flashlight on ourselves because that's where it starts. We need to really reflect about our landscape. And that's how we started this talk out. But really looking at ourselves and being honest, it's going to require to, to accomplish any of this is going to require an accountability system that holds institution executives and administrative leaders and medical educators responsible and accountable for student, resident, faculty, and staff success. And how effective are we in that institution? And that should be our driver for that. Lastly, I think it's going to, we're going to have to require and invest our time and our effort and our political capital uh, to begin having these discussions, to focus on uh, being equity advancing, learning how to mobilize our key internal and external uh, stakeholders. Our communities play a big role in this to partner with in order to address these inequities, because we're going to also have to go upstream to be part of that, um, to be part of that group as well, to understand the inequities start way upstream, but they still manifest uh, where we are you know, on the river. And also identify those exclusionary practices that have been identified and leverage that collective intelligence in order for us to move on and find solutions for this as well. So again, we've learned a lot from Diversity 3.0 um, and the benefits that we've talked about that are depicted here on this particular slide. There's also been a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, research that has come out since that time, thanks to the business industry that's been looking at inclusion for such a long time, that we're not, diversity alone is not enough. But the reality is we have to actually instructively you know, link both inclusion and diversity. And you know, that's something that we've all been saying, and I think people are coming to this, which is good. But this also does something else that's really important. The benefits of diversity can only be leveraged if you've got the right environment. And that's an environment that really values learning from our differences, not just our similarities, but our differences. That's where we grow. And the environment has to be set up to allow those differences to be visible, to be expressed freely, uh, without retribution and judgment, to be embraced and to be valued. This is uh, Howard Ross, who's written a lot on inclusive environments. And I think that one of the take home messages here is that, you know, the reality of this is just more than, um, than essentially affirmative action and being able to check the box that we have this many, many minorities or women uh, that are on our faculty and our, and our student body and our residents. This is about diverse employees need not only to be hired, but they want to be retained and they want to be integrated more fully into the social fabric and operations of, of the organization itself. And that's an important uh, concept to take home, is that they're not just there just to be our learners, they're not just there to serve our, to serve our needs as faculty uh, and administrators, but they also are there for their own growth and personal development, as I mentioned in the equity slide. So this is really looking at ourselves and creating the infrastructure, the policies and the practice where we recognize the existence of multiple perspectives. Because remember when people come to and work for us, they come with this with a large uh, gamut of experiences and talent that mainly is not limited to the titles that they bring to the table, but they have worked with other industries and they can have a lot of ideas and perspectives to bring to the deal, but are never asked because of the title or position that they hold. But we need to move to this, creating that infrastructure that we value those multiple perspectives as well. And then we single, we signal that importance of learning from them and also leveraging those differences. So really the goal here is to ensure that people from all backgrounds are fully integrated and they're not marginalized. They're fully engaged and they're not excluded, but fully empowered and not diminished. So what do studies of, so if we do this, what do studies, what have studies told us about the benefits of this if we do that? Well, the benefits I think everybody can basically relate to, and especially those that are in our leadership positions, is what business has been doing this research in the 1990s, and there's a lot that we can learn from. We're in the process now at the AAMC to find out as we start doing our outcomes-based research on this, will 
we find the same benefits that they have found? And I have a feeling we are. And these are just really quickly uh, the benefits that they have found over the last 20 years of doing this work uh, that ultimately, number one, that if you have an inclusive environment, um, that increases people's engagement, their, commu their commitment and motivation to do the work for the mission uh, and purpose of why they're there at the, at the school. That maximizes their production because, because they're engaged, they are fully uh, want to be uh, uh, utilize their talents to the highest degree and they maximize uh, uh, productivity. Also from that, um, then a positive impact on job satisfaction then arises, that sense of belonging also arises from that. That leads to a greater success in retention and impacts attrition. People are feeling utilized, they're feeling validated for what they, what they bring to that table. That in turn impacts brand reputation where suddenly institutions become talent magnets. The word gets out. This inclusive environment that this institution has is this is a place that you want to work out because they get it, they understand it, and allows me to be very productive and very engaged. What they found also in the, in the, in the, fifth, in the sixth bullet there is that they attract new talent. And they found even without doing diversity outreach that it enhances diversity of the workforce because of what's important to that institution, what they demonstrate. So again, if you think about this from, um, from a standpoint of, of a medical school, having people better engaged uh, in the provision of, of patient care, where they're more productive, they have higher job satisfaction and less burnout, this translates into happier patients and enhanced trustworthiness that they're gonna also have as well. So where does it start? Where, I mean, where do you even begin sort of thing? And so here just to say, just to suggest a few things. Number one, um, as we've learned in any type of change initiative and change management, Cotter talks about you have to create the vision. And so this is what we, a lot of the work that we've done now over the last three years um, being at the AAMC is that we've tried to create that vision for institutions because institutions basically uh, really didn't know where to start. They bought the diversity 3.0 concept but really didn't know where to start. So we decided to start with, this, with nine principles that we call the foundational principles of inclusion and excellence, which I'll talk about in just two seconds. Um, but in summary, this is a summary slide of what all those principles say. And that is number one, that diversity is accepted as a strategic imperative and it's intentional. And I've been at Stanford and, and I've had a chance to evaluate Stanford and do an assessment. And it's pretty clear to me that that is a strategic imperative without a doubt. And there's many people and many things in place that have shown the intentionality where the differences are valued and leveraged. But in an institution that also has achieved inclusion excellence, sense of belonging is valued where everyone feels that they're part of the fundamental fabric of the institution. You've already heard me say that, but just to reiterate, it's important. But that occurs because people can be authentic to who they are. That's valued. And also the institution recognizes the intersectionality of the multiple identities that you carry. I am just not a Latino. You know, I have multiple identities I bring to the table. I am not just a chief diversity officer. I have all these experiences that, have, that created my identity, but it's the intersectionality of those identities that really brings the full self you know, to the table, to be creative, to be innovative, as opposed to worrying about code switching, where I'm only gonna be, feel safe to only bring a few things. So that brings up the third bullet in the sense that practicing inclusion excellence and arriving at that in an environment means that it's a safe and it's a civil environment you know, safe and civil. Uh, we heard about psychological safety is what we're talking about, but having a safe learning and workplace environment or a brave space uh, really should be the norm, uh, where it allows voices to be shared openly without the fear of judgment or retaliation, that people can be their true selves and bring their true identities without this fear of, of retaliation. Dignity consciousness is practice. We had, we're born with inherent dignity and nobody has the right to violate our dignity. That's what dignity consciousness is but frequently the chronic and daily microaggressions, the discrimination, the prejudice, you know, basically violates that dignity. And so dignity consciousness is of mind, it's practice, and everywhere everyone feels validated for who they are and for what they bring to the table. Um, they also are valued for their contributions and they're also respected. And then it gets into this no notion of equity advancing in which the mindset changes now. It's an investment mindset that becomes adopted and exclusionary practices are identified. They're critically deconstructed and addressed and the professional uh, career development opportunities are equitably provided across the board. And last but not least, can't do this unless you have an accountability system. So we're moving forward of, I used to call it continuous diversity improvement. 
but it makes more sense to call it a continuous equity improvement because it really brings and encompasses everything of diversity and inclusion brings in it as well. But practicing CEI, just like CQI, it's a process in place where everybody accepts responsibility uh, for their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, and they're held accountable to it. Systems are in place. So once you create this vision, so to speak, then what's next? Well, it, what's next on that is that you have to assess yourself. And so some of these assessments are going on, but universally, the institution, every department should assess themselves about what are people's lived experiences. And so the foundations of, um, of principles of inclusion and excellence, which we call FPI for short, is basically a nine point survey that number one delineates uh, in more greater detail um, each of these principles that are outlined in the circle for you there, but has a good descriptive of what they are. And then we'll, we have done workshops and we have a toolkit available that brings these up, but it also includes an assessment, assessment of people's lived experiences as it relates to each of these nine principles. It comes with a scorecard as well, but more importantly, uh, what it does, it allows you to identify what are the bright spots where people are doing really well, um, or where are those spots that, you know, momentum hasn't really started in it, or we're just starting to talk about it, or we have a few things, but we haven't received excellence yet. But I got to believe that there's going to be some places and some units that are also having excellence that they can share. And that's where it becomes really important because one department's doing it really well. There's really no reason it can't go across departments and individual wide if somebody's doing a good job in one particular principle. And so what we've also included is an appendix, a 19 page appendix that we have collected over the last three years, uh, effective practices that are being demonstrated at other institutions for each of these particular uh, principles that we share with you along with resources of how to get there, people to contact to help drive, to hopefully drive this in a better way. Uh, we just finished piloting a self-administrative model. It's a pilot that was in pilot. Now how can we create this workshop, put it into a virtual uh, mode so that you can actually do it with a facilitator's guide and be able to guide that. Uh, and if interested, we can talk about it. So that's tier one of assessment. But again, there's other tiers uh, that I won't get too much into because many of you know about these. But just as a reminder, there's some deeper dives. If you find out there's a pain spot and we need to do a deeper dive after we've done the foundational principles of excellence, then the deeper dive would basically look at surveying it deeper with tools such as the diversity engagement survey. We have a new one that's going to be coming out in the fall for the diversity, inclusion, culture, equity assessment. Uh, and then we certainly have the faculty surveys called Standpoint that, uh, that we do. Other things that we're doing, so once you kind of develop the vision, you assess yourself, you have identified the bright spots, but also identified those pain spots. Um, some of those pain spots that we're starting to address, uh, to actively address and create as resources for folks are listed here. Some of you already know about the unconscious and microaggression training. Stanford's done a really good job in doing this as well in the School of Medicine, so I applaud you uh, with that. But a new, a new thing we're doing, we're looking at um, bringing restorative justice for academic medicine uh, into view. And we're doing a training of the trainer to use restorative justice circles to basically help mitigate mistreatment and harassment, but also how to build community. There's different tiers of restorative justice. Uh, I'm not gonna go into great details here, but we have some webinars that you're seeing there. We did a series of four webinars describing restorative justice and how it fits into, how it fits into um, everyday, everyday practice for us and stuff. There's some other wonderful work that's out there. I couldn't list everybody on the slide, but one that jumps out for me is the work done by University of Virginia, where they have basically um, created a series of uh, video vignettes uh, about what do you do when you, when you encounter disrespect in the classroom, in the wards, outside of that. Um, again, they developed this after the Charlotte, uh, Charlottesville incident sort of thing, uh, because there was a rise in uh, bigoted comments and frank discrimination from patients to health provider buyers to help that. And then we're actively right now looking at um, making a, um, an alliance with uh, uh, a particular vendor that is interested in providing bystander intervention training for our institutions as well. And then I'll just tie it and finish up with this, another initiative on gender inequity that was uh, launched um, um, this year. Uh, essentially, we have uh, a new CEO president um, that essentially is very committed to looking at both racial and ethnic equity, but also in gender equity. And in January of this year, uh, we announced this new initiative and we broke out with a new statement about um, uh, how, how our academic medical centers need to begin addressing the gender inequities that exist 
and that we as professionals need to basically bring that to the forefront and finally begin to try to eliminate gender inequities in academic medicine. It was endorsed by our AAMC Board of Directors as well. Um, and, and we have, this is one of our long-term commitments to advancing equity overall. Um, essentially, this is the site to go to. We have lots of resources. A lot of the evidence and literature is there as well, including toolkits that have been developed by teams like uh, the GWINS group and, and others, um, and some other institutions that are having some incredible success with some of the practices they're doing. But we have, we have uh, evidence and resources for, to uh, address workforce, including data, uh, leadership, promotion, compensation, and just the gender gaps and authors, authorship, research, funding, awards, et cetera. We also, can, we also just formed a new uh, group uh, internally at the WMC called the Gender Equity Innovation Lab. And its purpose is really to lead and amplify the work on addressing gender equity and addressing uh, sexual gender harassment in academic medicine. And that also can be found on the site. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this because it was launched yesterday. We have a new updated um, a monograph on the state of women in medicine that was just published yesterday and it's free. Uh, and there's the uh, part, there's a link to it. Um, you can use the online version or you can download a PDF on that. But the exciting part about this is that we went beyond what we did in 2014 when it was last uh, when it was last upgrade updated. Um, and now we're there addressing now scientific training pipeline data, which we never had before. Um, we're looking at also leadership uh, roles that women have. And so look at how many women are, are center or institute directors? How many women are in administrative faculty leadership roles? How many are in uh, dean's roles? How many are in administrative staff leadership roles? We also looked at faculty department chairs by race, ethnicity, and gender. And also there is the last part as uh, the perceptions of disrespect in the workplace that's very uh, uh, aligned with this particular time. And then the last thing we're doing, we made, uh, uh, we joined sponsorship <clears throat> with the AAAS and the AGU informing something called the Societies Consortium. And this is more at the um, academic STEM societies level to really kind of help societies, help their institutions in essentially developing uh, the right policies, understanding the law, understanding and providing with resources and tools for their institutions of how to mitigate and eliminate uh, gender inequities as well. So we're real excited. We have over 120 members, uh, societal members right now uh, that are very excited about putting this work together uh, and utilizing some of those tools uh, to, the tools together. So let me end with this particular slide. And um, again, my call to action to many of you is, is this. You know, there's a major cultural divide. Uh, that's what this picture is trying to depict. Um, that um, this is, by the way, it's in Da Nang, Vietnam, in case people want to know where this actual bridge is at. But again, in order to cross this cultural divide that we have sometimes at our institution to begin addressing this, it really requires intentionality about crossing this cultural divide. And that willingness to explore new ways of thinking and really are expanding our world voice. So I would say, can you reimagine what's possible if you cross that bridge? You know, it calls on you thinking about the institution and department levels and you individually also to focus on the, on the importance of inclusion and excellence and how do you achieve that in your environment? You should be asking yourself, have we achieved that in the clinic I work at, in the departmental space I work at as an institution? But understanding how inclusion and excellence, you know, role it plays in creating the foundation that's gonna be necessary to overcome some of the challenges and exclusionary practices that I've pointed out today that are in place. And again, I'm not here to blame. I'm just here to, here's the reality of it. What's our role in order to begin addressing this and no longer can we you know, put it on the back burner. It needs to be front and center uh, to us in order to begin accomplishing what we need. Because if we really want to diversify our workforce, if we really uh, believe and value it, and we want to see the benefits and uh, leverage those bonuses, it starts with we have to change that environment in order to attract the best talent uh, from the diverse workforce and, and to your institution. And then the last point I'll make is, again, can you reimagine what it would be like if we did become equity-minded leaders and if we did become equity-minded uh, medical educators and we practice conscious inclusion every day. That is that we're intentional in our commitment to reach inclusion excellence in both our learning environment and workplace environment. I think those are inextricably linked. That's why I always pose them together. And then if we do that, then we can emerge maybe as an equity-minded institution 
And think about what that means. What that means is that everybody in that academic institution community is recognized, um, is recognized, and this is a place where everybody has the opportunity to achieve their full potential. So my last summary slide puts it together for you um, in one depiction. So if you forgot everything I said in this talk, this is the only one that I, that I want you to walk away with. And that is, I think what I finally have come down to in my years in doing this work um, for many, many years, and I've been at the AAMC, I think if I put it all together, I, I look at diversity and inclusion and excellence as very important elements. But I think they're only a means to emerge um, you know, as, a, uh, as an equity-minded academic health center. What you see in front of you are the benefits from each of, for diversity and for inclusion excellence. Um, and so I think about a world in which, you know, we can achieve this equity piece, this third critical dimension, where everybody in that institution is provided that opportunity to be, you know, to provide and attain their full potential and, and what they're able to be. And equity is, is achieved when every person can do that. So when we merge as an equity-minded institution, I think that's when we finally approach and, and achieve excellence. So that, I'll stop there. Thank you for your listening here today, and thank you for being at Grand Rounds. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Acosta, and thank you to Fernando and to the whole lead team for bringing you here today. Um, I have a list of about 15 ways and places I want to disseminate this across campus, and I know Fernando and Bonnie Maldonado, who's our Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity, can help me with that. So Bonnie, so if we can just jump right into some of the questions. Um, oops, sorry, okay. Uh, Bonnie Maldonado asked, do you think it will be worthwhile to conduct the standpoint this year, given the trauma that COVID-19 has introduced? You know, I, I think what's really important, whether it's the, whether it's standpoint or whether it's another assessment, I think we can't assume and we can't anticipate how people are, what they're experiencing. And so I think taking the notion of trying to um, address what people's lived experiences are is a real critical piece. So it doesn't leave any room for assumption that we really know how we're doing. But I think, you know, one off is not enough. I think what's really important as we move into the post-COVID area, hopefully someday, that it's gonna be important to see how people are transitioning. Because I know even transitioning from working from home and getting back full time um, is gonna be, it's gonna play out quite a bit. And that's a major change. So change management's really important. And the only way I know how to do change management is you gotta have your finger on the pulse. So whatever assessment that you, work, that you wanna work with, I think it's really critical. Um, to really tap in to everybody's experience at, at all levels, not just the faculty, but I think at all levels to find out how they're doing. Um, because then you'll get a general sense about what should you be concentrating and not assume that you know which and where you need to put the efforts in in order to, in order to help those lived experiences. Right, okay, thank you. So I have two related questions. Um, the first one is what what is the minority tax? And then the question from Becky, our Associate Chair for Education, is how do you recommend we mentor, sponsor UIM learners and junior faculty without worsening the minority tax? Hmm. Well, again, I don't, I don't think mentoring them worsens it. So, well, let me start back with the minority taxes. The minority taxes that, again, URM faculty, students, residents always feel called upon because they come from a particular specific group, right? Uh, it could be LGBT, it could be a veteran, it could also be somebody from a race ethnic group, it could be women. Um, where they find trapped into this, into this, um, this label <clears throat> that ultimately that they are the content expert for that particular group. And then there's this unequity for faculty especially, and even for some of the students that are doing a lot of um, initiatives and programs because that's just who they are. They feel the battle between um, my obligation because I know what it feels like um, when I was you know, in your shoes, um, but also trying to balance it with scholarly activities. The minority tax is always being called. You're always the one that's being called to be on admissions. You're always the one being called and expected. That's the important line there. You're not only called upon uh, to participate in multiple committees, uh, curriculum development, um, student affair issues, those sorts of pieces, but, um, but the reality is that sometimes you find out that you're the only one that they call upon. And it really stretches people too far. 
And I think most people are willing to do that, but, the, but they basically are never paid for it, right? Yeah. Um, but it's the tax that because you're a minority, you need to do this because if you don't do this, then let's forget about you doing scholarly activity. Let's forget about you know, you being promoted. Let's forget about you being asked. And so it's that struggle. It's that struggle that's really important. I don't think mentorship worsens that. I think mentorship enhances um, students' abilities to deal with the minority tax and teaching them how to say no is a real critical space. How to say it, when to say it, uh, and when not to say it, I think is really critical. And I think that's where, I think that's where your, your, your mid-career faculty, your senior faculty are especially really good at that because they've learned that through trial and errors and stuff. I think we owe it to our students to really teach them up more. And that's where I think mentorship plays a big role with that sort of piece to do that. So I don't think it mentions it, but I think it's also our obligation as their mentors. I think it's our obligation, even our medical educators uh, and student affairs uh, deans to basically call those students aside and saying, um, you know, I think you're doing too much. Or I see you manifesting some of these burnouts or some of these places where you're starting to feel um, on edge. Um, mm -hmm. I think we need to do much more of that and call them out because what tends to happen is we also have this culture of, I'm not going to reveal myself because if I do, people are going to think I'm weak um, or I'm dysfunctional, right? Um, and they don't want to wreck the chances for that. But I think we need to be really vigilant. And that's what I mean by fast faculty development. I think it's really critical about what's the right approach? What are the right approaches? What, what tools can I have in my belt as a faculty member if I encounter this? And I'm having a difficult conversation with trying to convince a student and a resident that I care about who's over applying themselves um, and essentially I'm sensing manifestations of burnout or marginalization or isolation. You know, I think that's where we can reverse that minority tax piece. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, okay, the, uh, another a question from Archella Anthony, a number, another one of our leaders in diversity said, it seems that in some ways medical students have been the canary in the coal mine but not recognized as such until recently, similarly for staff, has the association examined the student-driven racial justice report card and considered that effort as a strategy to shift culture by elevating the narratives of learners and staffs as colleagues while addressing issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and excellence in academic medical school centers? Whew. I know. <laughs> um, I, I think I understand the question. Um, before I answer it really quickly, if I don't get to your question, please uh, reach out to me. My email is pretty simple. It's dacosta, D-A-C-O-S-T-A, at doubleamc.org. I'm happy to um, answer them offline by email and that sort of, if we don't get to you sort of thing because of our time limitation sort of thing. No, I, you know, again, I think it's, you know, I applaud the students for putting together yet another tool that really assesses certain manifestations of, of how our institutions operate. You know, and my, my recommendation is use a tool that works for you. And sometimes you have to experience and experiment with the number of different climate tools that are out there that people will begin paying attention to. And so as the racial uh, injustice scorecard is being developed and it's, and it's being matured over time, you know, it is a start. And I have been at places that have started to use it um, as kind of that lived experience place, right? Um, the hard part about it is it's um, by some it's criticized because of its methodology and on some of their aspects of it. But again, I think the important piece of it is that the main, the main point is this, use whatever tool um, that you can afford, that you have access to, that'll give you the information that you want. It really starts first with what do you want to know? Why do you want to know it? And then stylize and, and utilize the right survey that's going to give you that information. I find too often that people will get a survey or they'll put out a, um, they'll put out a, on a listserv, hey, who knows of a good diversity survey, but they're not really explicit. And so everybody's given you, you know, tens of thousands of these sorts of things. But I think what I've learned over time is that each survey uh, really looks for different levels of uh, information that is really critical to bring it to so. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I thank you for your contact information because uh, unfortunately we're running a little long and I, I know I can't get to every question. So I'm going to try to do one more. So mm -hmm. here, like many academic medical institutions, promotion, especially for our clinical educator faculty, um, depend on regional reputation. Can we, and in addition to networking, can we measure that more systematically and objectively to minimize bias or reduce part-time tax? 
And I'm sure read the read the first part about that again. Make sure yeah, I and I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that part-time tax means folks that aren't full-time, maybe. So okay. if appointments and promotion depend on regional reputation and networking, can we measure that more systematically and objectively to minimize bias? Um, so I'll, I'll take a crack at it if I, if okay. I can understand it again. Because okay. um, I think one of, the, one of the problems with a lot of the data that we collect, we collect data specifically on ladder faculty, full-time faculty, right? Um, and we're trying this latest report on women in, in academic medicine basically begin, start, starting to look finally at that part-time piece. Mm. And so, uh, again, I think it's an excellent question to ask uh, with regards to that. And if I look at that in, in the sense of what type of a scholarly or networking can happen, you know, I think we're in this new world of virtual connection. And I think that I would ultimately say, one of the things I know that helped my particular career was um, when I got involved with the AAMC as a constituent, I found it as a wonderful vehicle to provide poster presentations, uh, papers, abstracts, to kind of get uh, U of W on the mark of what we were doing. And I was really surprised how much that that um, that put it on the mark. And at that time, I was also a part-time faculty. I wasn't full-time. I later did become full-time, but the reality was is it was a nice vehicle to kind of get that started. And also what that introduced me to was it introduced me to some AAMC folks that were very interested in the work I was doing. And then I got asked to be on some of the committees, such as the Holistic Review Committee, got asked to be on the MCAT Committee and others that really kind of propelled me in my national notoriety for it, really helped my promotion with my dean, without a doubt, because he knew that we were putting the uh, University of Washington on, on the radar, which I think was really helpful for any school that does that. And that's true, been true for many of our colleagues that are out there too. So I think no, there's- uh, no, sorry. Nope, I'm oh, sorry, I was just gonna say that was really helpful. And one of the things we think is important for our senior faculty is not just to mentor, people, but to sponsor them, to help them identify those opportunities. A great and point, on that. Absolutely. Yeah, all right. So I'm sorry we have to wrap it up. I'm just going to, the last question is, can you just tell us your email one more time again? Sure. <laughs> D as in David, A-C-O-S-T-A, -S my last name, at A-A-M-C dot org. Perfect. All right, with, thank, uh, with that, I want to thank every, all our participants, and we'll go ahead and close the session. Thank Great. you so much. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. Yeah. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.